Well, welcome everybody. Just gonna get my setup here. All the windows oriented appropriately. <clears throat> I'm glad you can make it. We're gonna talk about something that's a little bit different than I normally talk about, right? I mean, I'm a yoga teacher and um, some of you know, I also am a nutrition consultant, holistic nutrition consultant and a health coach. And um, I have some things to say about what to eat to nourish your bones. It's part of our, our plan, right? So, all right. So I hope you have a pen and paper nearby. This isn't going to be a, pro, uh, a presentation of like, eat this, eat this, eat this, you know, it's going to be more about like principles to follow and things to apply to your personal situation because everyone's situation is different. Everyone eats in a particular way for a lot of different reasons. It could be um, choices that you make that, that have, um, you know, not only do we all share this common issue with low bone density, but we have other things going on. So everyone's choice of what they eat is, is very individual. So I want you to sort of take note of what applies to you and the rest of the stuff you can just leave on the side. It doesn't matter. Um, and if you have questions, since I'm doing this on my own, what I'd appreciate is we're going to have time at the end for questions. So if you can just hold your questions till the end, um, maybe write them down on the piece of paper and then, you know, we can, you know, put them in the chat at the end and I'll be able to see them better. If they come in during the whole presentation, I'll lose track of them. Um, and then, or you can unmute, we can have a little chat with the questions at the end, but all right. So I'll have plenty of time for that at the end. Um, I'm going to start out with this, this little saying that everyone knows when you give a person a fish, you feed them for a day, right? You feed them for a day. But if you teach them to fish, you feed them for a lifetime. But I bet you that if I gave you a can of sardines, that I wouldn't even feed you for a day, right? Even if I told you that it was filled with calcium, right? We all know we need to have more calcium. Sardines are, are one of the highest levels of, of calcium, especially if they have the bones in them. Um, but it's, it's not going to work for you sometimes. You know, some people may absolutely love them, but we're told like we have to make our bones strong. Like we're, then the calcium is going to make it strong. And we get kind of this, this very minimalistic nutrition advice from our doctors. When we get our DEXA scan, it'll say, okay, increase your calcium, your vitamin D and do a little weight training. It's really basic and very cookie cutter, right? Very cookie cutter. Cause it's like, they don't really know what you've been eating or, and they kind of make it sound like our bones are made of milk or something, right? It's made of dairy. Like we need to get more dairy in our system and our bones will just be okay. But our bone health plan, you know, you've all been down this road for a while. It's, it's going to take some time to envision it, you know, figure out what your goal is and then make that plan. If there's certain steps that you're going to take in your bone health plan, right? And of course it's made up of a lot of different pieces. We have the exercise piece, which is really paramount. We have to remind our bones that they need to be strong. Um, we have the nutrition part. We need to nourish them. We need to nourish them. And that's with the, you know, both of these two pieces, I think are pretty tricky because, you know, the exercise depends on your current capability and you can grow to be stronger and more flexible and have all this stuff. Same with nutrition. There's sort of a baseline we have to attain and then we can go from there. So, um, and then the other pieces might be a big piece of it is self-care. I'm going to just like loop it up into self-care because stress, of course, can be really detrimental to our bones. Um, and, and sometimes medicine is necessary. So there's a lot of pieces to this puzzle of our bone health plan, right? But we know that we're also more than just our bones. We have a whole ecosystem inside of us and things are are at a certain, you know, there's just so many levels to who we are as a human being. And so many things are, are bringing it brought into our system and they nourish a lot of different things in our body, not just our bones, right? So you pretty much everybody on the call will know that I am a, a yoga teacher. I'm a yoga therapist and I've been practicing yoga since my daughter was young and she'll be 34 this, this year. And I've been teaching since 2009. And I'm learning a lot from, from my yoga practice, from the yoga teachings about how we have to address the individual 
no matter what, we are all, you know, we're all this same human species, but we are individuals. So this comes back and back. This is sort of a recurring theme and in, in how I teach. Like we can all have group classes, but I want you to tune into what's appropriate for you, right? And a few years ago, um, I, I had a day job as, as an editor in a publishing company, but I went to school for nutrition, mainly because my 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 um brother was had cancer at the time and they were not helping him with cancer with nutrition and anyway long story that's a whole other thing but anyway i went to nutrition school went to bowman college and learned about nutrition um from a holistic standpoint meaning i wasn't going to go down the road of becoming a registered dietitian and have to do all this calculation and work for the, the government standards i wanted to know how do you really nourish yourself and and that also led me into taking some functional medicine training as a health coach and taking some training through the applied school of functional medicine um, on bone health and gut health. And so there's always sort of this trail that led us to this point. And so sometimes instead of just dealing with this current moment, you have to go back in history a little bit and kind of collect the dots or, or, or connect the dots is what I want to say and, and figure out what can we do to kind of shift things going forward, right? And then, of course, when I um, found out I had low bone density, I went down the path of how does this really apply to bone health? You know, I'm a bone health and osteoporosis foundation ambassador. I took the bone fit training. So I'm applying this all to our bones, right? But also knowing that our bones are, are a piece of us and, and there's a, this whole other system that we're trying to also affect. So at Bowman College, this was their schematic for eating for health. It was really super applicable to everyone. So this is sort of the foundation for eating for health, like basic health. We want to have this, the, the outer circle is about hydrating your system, right? We all know we need to bring some pure water or juices or herbal teas or mineral broths like that. Like just bringing hydration into our system is a big, big piece of it. And, and then of course, fruits and vegetables and unrefined starches. And then that yellow thing is about like these extra pieces that can boost the nutrients in your, in your system and, and in the foods that you eat through spices and seaweed that has a lot of minerals and nutritional yeast and algae. And some of these things may be pretty foreign to what you normally eat, right? What you've been brought up to, but protein is sort of at the core. We all need a, a significant amount of protein for the lasting energy and to build tissue. And then seeds and oils, like the fats, the fats, like targeting the fats is really important. So I like, really liked their, you know, Dr. Bowman, he put this together and I thought it was a really good way of envisioning, like, is this the foundation of, of, of what I'm eating right now? Am I attaining a certain level of health, let alone feeding our bones, which we'll get to that, but am I attaining this piece of it, right? Because if we're not attaining that, then what I was learning in school and, and you know, we see on the headlines, like it, it, your body reacts to things that are not appropriate to it, or if it's not getting the nutrition that it needs. And chronic inflammation occurs with the body kind of just biting off toxins or you know different bacteria or whatever like there's things that happen in the body that create chronic inflammation and and it can be the precursor to a lot of different diseases which osteopenia and osteoporosis are are one of them so i want you to get your piece of paper out right now and a pen and and we're going to go through these guidelines and there's 10 items that are sort of principles to follow and i you know many of you are probably doing 10 out of 10 here but then think about it in a scale because i think there's something that we can all do that is is a, a refinement of what we do um i hope you can come away with a few, a few little nuggets from here but let's go one by one and you can put a little check mark or a number by it like are you really 100% doing this or maybe 50-50, that kind of thing. Just sort of get a baseline of what you're doing. Now, so the first one, increase your intake of seasonal, organic, unrefined, meaning fresh, local foods. And then we've made this little acronym, soul food, right? So how often are you intaking these foods in your day, in your week? Um, do you get thrown off base for different things? Just kind of get a sense of that. That's sort of the basics of, a, of, a, of the nutrition that we need, right? Drinking plenty of purified water, herbal tea each day. So, and then, you know, minimizing that caffeine. So those two and three kind of go hand in hand. Some people will 
sort of rely on that caffeine for energy, you know, maybe one cup in the morning is fine, you know, but if you're in the afternoon, we have that lull and there's, you take the caffeine, which I did for years. You can also think from that functional medicine standpoint, like, okay, you're doing this now, but what did you do back in the day, you know, when you were in your twenties or something like, um, I know I drank way too much coffee in my twenties, but anyway, so kind of keep your, your tab on, on how you're doing with this. Number four, eat protein by 10 a.m. So start your day off strong with some, some decent protein or fats, like something that's not going to spike your blood sugar, but really starts the day off on an even energy level. Um, and one to three more times during the day to curb that sweet tooth. So again, sometimes in the afternoon, we'll end up having that cookie or that sweet because our, our energy has lulled. And um, but if we're eating more protein, then it kind of sustains through that whole um, whole day. Um, and then number five, decreasing your intake of refined and artificial sugars, right? White flour products, unnatural fats and added hormones, preservatives, colors, antibiotics. Well, this is what Dr. Bowman would call nutrition bandits. They're going to just take up space in your caloric intake and not give you much nutrition. So kind of judge, you know, sometimes, you know, we're, we're not all perfect. We're all going to sometimes have that whenever, you know, like even last night I was here in LA, I went to In-N-Out Burger. I have to when I'm here. Right. So, you know, that kind of thing It's like, what are you doing? Like, oh, like most of the time. Number six, diversify sources of proteins, fats, and carbohydrates. So eating a variety of foods. How are you in a, in a rut? Like you're eating the same thing over and over and over, um, that kind of thing. Um, and then next one would be eating more. Now think about this, eating more monosaturated, unsaturated, rather monounsaturated fats like olive oil, avocado, almonds, than the saturated fats, animal, dairy, coconut, or polyunsaturated, the seed oils. It doesn't say avoid all seed oils, right? It doesn't say that. It doesn't say, it just says eat more of the monounsaturated because those are the omega-3s and less of the other ones that are omega-6s because we want a ratio. We can really easily in our standard American diet get the, the non-ones. Um, and I just want to remind you, if you missed the beginning, I'm asking you to hold your questions till the end because I won't be able to see them at the end um, as we go along. Um, and I'll and I might lose them in the chat. So hold your questions and we'll um, you can put them in the chat later, okay? All right, so the so the the ratio of your questions are or your oils is important. Um, and then decrease your consumption of gluten containing grains and to prevent digestive disturbance and inflammation. This is a good good one to think about. M many of us have found that either we've had undiagnosed celiac, which is a, a reason that we've become osteoporotic or one of the contributing factors, um, or we're just gluten insensitive. It really causes a lot of inflammation or gut, gut disturbances because everybody actually has uh, a response to gluten. So, um, and then if you think about when, once you go gluten-free, you find out there's a lot of gluten in our, generally in our diet. So um, if you can sort of decrease that, if you don't have to necessarily go gluten-free, but sometimes you do and you feel better and that's the way to go. Um, and then of course, eat three portions of vegetables in a meal to one serving of protein and one serving of fat. And we're going to talk about these kinds of sort of dictated percentages and serving size and things like that. And that's where it gets a little bit tricky because these are, um, it's like, what's a serving size and what's my portion of it? What, what makes me feel full and that kind of thing. But in general, we want, we want the ratio to be more vegetables and just a little bit of protein and fat to go along with it because pro we have to remember that vegetables are, um, not only giving you a lot of nutrients, but they're also carbohydrates. So they burn up pretty quickly. So we wanna slow that insulin response down with the proteins and the fats. And then number 10, enjoy your food and eat in peace because this is when the body's gonna actually be able to digest it. This is one thing I learned in school that we were talking you know, about all these things we should eat, da, 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 da. And time and time again, the teacher would say, yeah, but if you're stressed, you're not going to be absorbing any of that. You're not going to be digesting that. You'll be, if you're eating on the run or anything like that, like you're, you're not giving your body that time to digest it, which we'll talk about a little bit more. Okay. So here's some more keys. So I hope you sort of took note of that, but here's some other things sort of 
the general gist of like, we want to eat well every day. It's kind of a, a no brainer. If you're well, to, if we can eat well every day, that's going to have a positive effect on our health. Maintaining a positive attitude, and this goes back to sort of thinking about the yoga piece of it, like we're maintaining a positive attitude, a lightness in our heart, and we're stretching and moving and breathing deeply throughout the day. So, you know, holistic nutrition wants to think about, you know, how we're, we're in our body. And the moving and the stretching is helpful for motility, helping the, the food go down into the, the intestinal system and all that. So we're helping the, the body digest and absorb by just moving and breathing and moving through the, the lymphatic system as well. So cleansing the body. Um, and connecting with your own true self with others through service, spiritual practice, or love of life, and being a lifelong learner. So there's there's this sense like there's nutritional sciences, and then holistic nutrition is more about that sort of biopsychosocial spiritual approach to our health. And um, to me, I just sum it up from that yoga piece of me is that it's uh, body, mind, and spirit, right? So I would sit in these classes and think, okay. So yoga and nutrition really go hand in hand. Like you, you need something, you know, whether it's yoga or some other practice that keeps you grounded and in this sort of rest and digest state. Um, and, and you need to be nourishing yourself and being aware of what's right for you. Like some people will say, a lot of times my, my private clients will say, I eat healthy. I'm sure you do. And then we go through it and there's some things that we need to finesse or there's some, some headlines that they read and they think, okay, if I'm doing this, I'm eating healthy, but it ends up that that may be triggering something in their system. So it's a little bit, it's a little bit about having your own self-knowledge about what's appropriate for you. Um, but I've, I'm learning more and more that it's especially for your bones, because first of all, I want to clarify for some people who, um, that yoga is more than just an exercise program. You might think, okay, my yoga class or my yoga that, but yoga is really, yes, it's a class. And what we're infusing in those classes is this philosophy of life where we're, you know, we're moving, we're breathing, we're meditating, we're focusing our mind um, on the present moment so that we're not, um, you know, we're not, um, we're not reacting to things around us, we're responding. There's a slight difference, right? Calming the mind, we're steadying all the systems in the body. We're helping the body, which always wants to stay in a state of homeostasis, um, you know, with the pH levels are very, very tightly regulated, all this stuff. Yoga is going to be helping with that because the point is to keep the mind and the body in the present moment and not in the past or the future, right? So we live life more in that rest and digest state. The nervous system is, is calm. And we think of the, the digestive system as this kind of track through our body. We start out with the mouth and it comes down to the stomach and it goes through the intestinal system. And there's a lot of fluids and things that come in to help break down the foods. And But I want to open up your, your perspective on what the digestive system is by thinking about the beginning of it is, is actually in the senses, right? So um, smell what we smell our food, when we smell our food, it's like Pavlov's dog, we'll start to maybe salivate, right? So if we're not taking the time to smell, or if you've ever been sick and you can't smell and food tastes really badly, well, you know, so it's, uh, so smell is a piece of the digestive system because it starts the body going, oh, we're gonna have something really delicious coming in pretty soon. You know, sight, how does your food look? You know, if something doesn't look appetizing, your body's going to go, well, we're, we're really not, really don't want that coming into our system. But, you know, so sight is part of it also to get the process starting to go touch. Now you can think about it like, what does it feel like in your hands? But also, what does it feel like in your mouth, right? The, 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 the what do they call that? The mouth feel of a food, right? Like sometimes it's a texture thing that makes you want to eat a food or not. And this will have an effect on are you stimulating the digestive system at the onset, right? Hearing, like if you're cooking and you're hearing it sizzle or, you know, things like that, like, you know, and, and also hearing in the sense that if you're in a, an environment that's really loud or you're, there's stuff coming in, you can think about all these senses are also taking in information from the environment. So if you're in a quiet place, then again, the body can be, okay, we're in a safe, quiet place, you know, kind of going back to um, thinking about it sort of an anthropological way, like thinking about um, 
you know, we're safe, we can digest, we can sit down here for a moment, and of course, taste. So as soon as it comes into your mouth, is it tasting right? And is the, you take time to chew your food, right? Because then the other end of the digestive system, so that's the beginning, all the senses, and the other end isn't just that when it comes and eliminates from your body, but we think that there's digestion all the way through your body. Every tissue has a digestive system and it goes all the way to the cells. So we want to have that time. We want to have really good sleep patterns so we can have that sort of micro digestion happening at a time where you're taking in, uh, you know, taking in nutrients on a cellular level and also um, uh, eliminating waste on a cellular level. And during your sleep is when, mostly when that happens, right? So... Uh, a sister uh, science of yoga, some of you know about Ayurveda, talks about um, how the nourishment comes into our body and it goes through these seven datus. So it goes off to the, the left-hand side. Whoops. And the first tissue is our plasma, and then it goes into our blood and our muscle, and then our fat. It actually nourishes into our fat because we need fat in our body to hold nutrients, hold some of the the vitamins that we need for other other processes in our body then it hits our bone and cartilage and it goes into what's in our bones the nerves and the bone marrow and then eventually the reproductive system so they envision the body digesting in the in, th in through these seven datus they're called so when you nourish your body deeply you're nourishing your bones right so this is a different mindset than that um, sort of Western medical, oh, just take calcium and vitamin D. No, we want to nourish our body so our bones are not um, in that fight or flight stage and offloading is, you know, calcium. They want to have time to, to be strong and steady and take in the nutrients. Because this whole process, the Ayurveda practitioners say, the, the teachings from Ayurveda say, this whole thing would take about 35 days to get to the very end of this, this road. And so you, when you start to change how you eat, you have to give yourself about a month. You know, you know that sometimes elimination diets are about a month long because you're starting to shift what's coming in and how things are actually um, being digested through your system. So a lot of it has to do with how you eat, right? Slowing down so that you can actually taste or hear or sense or see the, the food acknowledging what you're about to put in your in your mouth, chewing so that you don't just dump a bunch of stuff into your stomach, and then prioritizing eating. A lot of times you're really, really busy, right? And you and you just grab food on the fly and um, you have to you have to be really um, you have to be sequencing your day so that you can prioritize eating because you're nourishing yourself. Otherwise you find yourself at the end of the day or just before you know, late afternoon, and that's when you want to reach for the sugar or the coffee or something like that. And then this is something very Ayurvedic is that don't drink too much during meals because we want those digestive juices to be really, really potent. And if we're watering it down, then they're not as potent to start breaking down the food in our stomach. So you just take sips and wash out your mouth and kind of maybe mix it with a little water when you're eating something a little drier, but you're not guzzling a bunch of uh, water during um, during your meals. You take the water before or after in your, in your system. And then also thinking about the timing, the timing of the year, the timing of the day, like trying to eat at regular intervals during the day, but also thinking about what's available to you, going back to that first guideline, the seasonal, organic, unrefined, and local foods, like the seasonal foods. So are we getting into that rut where we're not diversifying our proteins, carbs, and, and uh, the macronutrients enough because we really want that tomato salad in December when tomatoes are not really fresh where we are probably? depending on where you are in the world. But, um, you know, so thinking about that seasonality of foods is really helpful so that you're getting the nutrients that meet the demands of the of the weather changes and how you're reacting to the, 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 um, the temperature of the day or the activity level. Sometimes we're a little bit more sedentary in the winter than the, than the summer, that kind of thing. So we're looking at time in these different aspects. And then we're looking at time of our life, right? So as we go through life and we have that peak bone mass, and then we hit this later stage where the bones start to, to, to degenerate in some way, 
And, um, and so does everything else. So does our stomach acid. So does our, our enzymatic responses, our metabolic responses. So we have to just keep that in mind. So we may be eating a little bit less than we did back then, but it really depends on how much your, your active, your activity level is like really have to tune in. This is again, where the yoga and the nutrition come hand in hand. Okay. So getting back to that, that sardine can, this is not a very appetizing meal on your plate, right? <laughs> no, I loved when I found this picture. But um, so what are you going to do with a sardine can? You know, you're going to maybe ask for a few recipes, right? So what can you do with the sardines? But then every recipe has to be adjusted to who you are. And some of the things that come into play that you need to adjust, of course, is your food philosophy. Maybe you don't even eat animal protein of any kind. Um, Maybe you uh, are, but maybe you're an omnivore and you're just eating 100% animal protein or carnivore. And so your food philosophy has a lot to do with what you're going to be eating. Your food sensitivities, you know, like looking at a recipe and if it has wheat in it, you're not doing wheat. Like, how do you modify that? This is who you are. Like, you don't take, um, take it as a, you know... Um, a requirement that you have to eat this because it's good for your bones, right? Um, what does it taste buds? Maybe you maybe you eat fish, but maybe sardines are just not your thing, right? Your your taste buds are big. Remember, we said that's the beginning of the digestive system. What's your budget? What's your budget? Maybe you can't can't afford a lot of this this different organic foods or this fresh and local food. So there's a lot of options we can do with, you know, getting canned tin fish is actually a really um, economical way to get these uh, omega three fatty acids through the fish if you eat fish. But um, and then cultural cuisine. When I was doing um, when I was first going through uh, nutrition school, I um, was. I was making these meal plans. We had this, this process where we would understand what the client needed. And then we would come up with these meal plans and the, the choices that I would put together for these meal plans were, were just based on my cultural knowledge and what I would normally cook. And I started realizing like, this is not appropriate for some of the people that I'm working with. And so we would co-create like how they would make things because you know, I, I grew up on, on my heritage is Irish and German and English. So I had like meat, potato, vegetable kind of setups on my on my plate versus something else that, you know, someone, a good friend of mine, Gauri, she's Indian, like her foods are, are a melange of beautiful, beautiful ingredients. So this cultural cuisine is going to have you um, sort of sort out how do you put this these principles into play based on what you are, are more inclined to eat. And then, of course, your desire or ability to cook. A lot of people are don't want to cook anymore, or they just don't don't have the desire. But going back to prioritizing eating, how are you going to sort of manage that? Like the desire and ability to cook. There's a lot of workarounds. I work when I work with private clients. We talk about meal prep or or um, things, getting things at the store that are already sort of pre-cut or something like that. Although um, we can also go into the realm of like sometimes chopping vegetables for for dinner and listening to a podcast or something can be part of the ritual, the ritual of eating, right? So, you know, you can work on that. Um, and sometimes just teaching people how to cook, again, that teaching people how to fish is, is a, a way to go. But then we, you know, you may all know this, right? You know, all this stuff is probably nothing new for you, but, but the... But then you get thrown this diagnosis of osteoporosis. And what do you do? Like you're looking at this, this bone density scan and you're imagining these bones on the right-hand side that are starting to thin on the outside and starting to break down on the inside. And you're like, what do I do? They tell me to eat cal calcium. So then you go searching on the internet, right? You go, oh, gosh, you go searching on the internet. You don't even rely on what you know already on this, right? You go down a rabbit hole, right? I've been there. I know this too, right? And you listen to people on Facebook pages and you you go, I don't know, you get a lot of information. You should be eating this. And then you start learning it's not just calcium and and vitamin D, it's something called boron and then it's silicon. And people are saying you really have to get the phosphorus, right? And then magnesium, that's a big one too. Like you start getting all this information and it's it's a lot in your hand, right? So you feel like you're empowered, but it's just a little bit overwhelming, right? And you come back with a lot more questions. You know, what about this? How do I get that? Where is this? So then you 
luckily there's some people on the internet and uh, particularly on Instagram, they make things look really simple. They make these beautiful charts and things like the most popular vitamins or the top 10, this for your bones, or they make it look really simple and you'll get this list. And then my question is always like top 10 of vitamins for who, who is going to be, <laughs> who is going to be actually eating this and, and how do you get that? But what the problem is, um, you know, these, when we're looking at these servings that we're supposed to get, this is um, from Bowman College, like eating for health serving chart, you look at your daily servings on the, uh, on the left-hand side and the serving side size in the middle there, and then examples of the foods that you would get. This is all food-based, but there's ranges. See, those daily servings are ranges, two to three servings of seeds and oils, two to four servings of protein. And then they give you examples. What's a serving? Three, three ounces of animal protein, six ounces of vegetable, one cup of leafy vegetables. You know, so this is, you can start to collect this information and start to look at what you're eating. And, but then again, get a little, little wonky when you think about the protein intake, they say is 0.7 to one gram of protein per pound of body weight per day. Okay. So put on your math hat and you start to calculate, okay, first of all, what's a gram? We don't always know what grams are. So in parentheses here, I have 4.5 to 6 ounces of protein daily. But then they add these sort of caveats because they realize it's not, not this isn't a, a prescription for one person. There's a range. They've given you a range. So, but if you are physically active or over 30, you should aim for the higher end because you need more protein to keep yourself going. But then less active people need the lower end. So what if you're less active, but you're over 30? This is why it gets a little bit crazy when people give you these things. But but when I work with someone one on one, we can we always um, work this out based on what what their situation is. Anyway, and we also you know we'll start to start calculating this. And some people are really good and big at, on calculating this. And I don't want to say good actually. I want to just say that that's that's their jam. They really want to calculate it all. But that can get a little bit more in your mind, right? Like I you know you start to um, get a little bit uh, more focused on calculating it than anything else, right? Um, but I do, when I work with somebody privately, we usually do at least three days just to see, like I'm asking you right now, just take a take a note about what you're eating. Um, and there's a really good calculator, I have to say, the Bone Health and Osteoporosis Foundation has this simple calcium calculator because it's even when you're calculating and even when you have all of this stuff down and you really understand it, it's really not 100% accurate, right? And I want you to know that because it'll give you a gist of it. You can be taking in all the right foods, remember? You can take in all the right foods, but if you're not digesting it correctly, it's not going to get absorbed and it's not going to take that time to get all the way to the bones. So there's a, you know, there's something about this knowledge. Yes, take it in. Now work on the other pieces of the bone health plan, the self-care, the exercise, right? And maybe the medications. Because otherwise, when you're looking at so hard at the at these nutrition facts, you start to think of all of your meals in this, in this way, right? And then you start saying, well, if I need magnesium or if I need boron or if I need silicon, I need to, I don't know how to get that. So I'm just going to, they tell me I need X amount of this in my diet. I'm going to take a supplement. So then you go down the supplement rat hole and you start taking supplements and you start like not thinking about all the stuff that you're getting in your food. A lot of times I'm actually weaning people off their supplements because they're actually eating a really good, diverse food in their diet. So it, um, Michael Pollan wrote a book in defense of food. He wrote a couple of books in omnivores dilemma and that kind of thing. But in defense of food, he brings up this concept of nutritionism. Now nutritionism is, and according to Wikipedia is a paradigm that assumes that it is the scientifically identified nutrients in the foods that determine the value of individual foodstuffs in the diet. So eating this apple is just about what they have calculated in these nutrition facts, but that's not true, right? And the Institute of Functional Medicine puts it a different way because food is more than nutrition. We believe it's essential to have optimal amounts of these nutrients and to be nourished through the power of yum. The joy of cooking and eating and the courage to be creative while increasing control of our food supply and meal preparation. So nourish through the power of yum, right? So 
there's, you know, there's a lot of confusion. I'm hoping we're I'm hoping we're closing the door on confusion and kind of wandering into the path and through the door of clarity in this in this presentation. Because what I want to do is step away from the supplements and I want to open it up so that we can talk more about food. Food first, right? Because food is where all of the the nutrients are, right? And um we can learn more about food and about cooking and about how we can nourish our own self, right? Because um, we want to have a lot of what I'm calling MVPs, minerals, vitamins, phytonutrients. These are in all foods, right? And you can see the pictures, little pictures of the fish and the milk and the pumpkin and things like that, all the minerals, all the vitamins. And then the phytonutrients, there's like 25,000 phytonutrients that are identified by nutrition scientists. Um, there are things like, you know, resveratrol or isoflavins, that, that kind of thing. You might've heard those words. So there, there's all these things in, in uh, foods. And of course, these are considered the micronutrients because they started to get more and more detailed in their scientific study of food when they went down that nutritionism path, right? And then of course, these are the macronutrients, the proteins, the fats, the carbohydrates, and, um, it's, it used to be like separated out. And I want to highlight that they are uh, overlapping, right? So cheese can have fat and protein, you know, nuts can have carbohydrates and fat. So you can keep this in mind. Um, I love this because this image in particular is pretty cool to me because the carbohydrates, as you see, are vegetables and fruits and they don't have bread in there, right? So they, they oftentimes we are just sort of like in this picture, the carbs on the top are is the bread and the pasta and the rice. And of course, those are carbohydrates. The grains are that. But we have to know that we can also bring in not only these macronutrients, but fiber. And that there's some crossover. There's fiber in a lot of different things. There's fiber in bananas and bananas and carbs. And then there's proteins um, from the fish. And there's fats in the fish and that kind of thing. And there's a lot of different um, overlapping uh, from these macronutrients. And of course, fiber is really, really important for that gut health because we want to obviously um, not only stay full longer so that we don't go towards the sugars and the caffeines, but we also lower, lower your blood cholesterol. We lower the, the, in, um, the reaction to the blood sugars. Um, it also um, eases and prevents constipation. So we're eliminating things that we are not... Um, not needing anymore, right? The waste, every every piece of our digestive system, it has to be eliminated somehow. So gut health is really big. Gut health is really big, not only for our bones, but um, for, because of the metabolic health, but also the immune health, because the bones are the ones that make our immune system, right? The bone marrow is making uh, immune cells. Um, it also, gut health will help us with sleeping so that we are digesting all that deep, 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 deep micro digestion down to our, down to our bones and beyond. Um, mental health, like if we're uncomfortable, if we ever have a stomach ache, this very rarely, we say stomach ache, but it's very rarely that we put our hand where our stomach really is, which is just below our rib cage. You know, maybe after Thanksgiving dinner or something like that, like a big dinner, it'll we'll it's like, whoa, we really feel that stomach a lot. Usually when we say we have a stomach ache, our hand kind of goes down around our belly button. And that's like that's happening in the small intestine and the, and the large intestine area. So something's kind of gone awry in that digestive piece. So gut health is a piece that's really important on on understanding your health. Um, you know, because all disease, and Hippocrates says all disease begins in your gut. So getting back to the functional medicine concept of the power of yum, how, how do we increase the power of yum? Like really grab hold of it and, and have fun with it. And what I share with my clients is we're just think about it without any measurement. You know, we've already measured, we see sort of this baseline where you are. Now let's eat the rainbow. Now, what does that mean? So what I want you to do in the chat, I want you to think about your favorite foods that are green. So in the chat, you can start to write a few things in the chat about what are your favorite foods in the green that are in the green. You can see some on the screen. Maybe you really like, um, you know, basil or avocados or something. So go ahead and write in the chat. Do y'all know where the chat is? You can go ahead in the chat. Yeah, bok choy and arugula. Those are great. Yeah, thanks, Julie. 
broccoli, lovely. Avocado, broccoli, edamame, yep, lovely. These are all these things. All of it, Ellie says, yeah. Favorite foods are avocados and zucchini, Michelle says. And avocado, broccoli, kale, kale's wonderful. We have lots of Brussels sprouts, yeah. No kale, <laughs> okay. Yeah, see, again, you have your taste buds or you have your, to me, when I was growing up, kale was um, a, a decoration on the plate at the restaurant. We didn't eat curly kale. Like it was just, you know, on the plate. Cucumbers and peas, wonderful. Yeah, Swiss chard, you're seeing, love it. Yes. So these are some of the greens that we can bring. So if we're thinking about the, the um, eating for the rainbow, we can think about, oh wait, what are these greens that we can bring in? Green foods, cucumbers are really, really good and in, in lots of micronutrients and they're really um, seasonal right now, right? Okay, so let me get back here. How about reds? How about reds and pinks? You can start to see microgreens, Cynthia says, with the greens. How about reds? Purples. You can start to see how pretty it looks with the green too, right? Raspberries, yeah, this time of year. Tomatoes, this time of year, perfect. Yeah, tomatoes only in season. I know they're terrible when they're not in season, right? They don't taste very good at all. And I'm not a big tomato fan, but I, I do like them when they're in season. Pomegranates, yes, really good for you. Red peppers, lovely. Strawberries, Tomatoes and carrots, you can see them right here, there's orange. Like even like in this picture, there's oranges. Now like think about, yeah, grapefruits, oranges and yellows and browns and what, what other foods? Think about more foods that have color that you really like. What are some of your favorites in these realms? Beets, love beets. And they're all different colors of beets too, right? Lots of different colors. Radishes, persimmons, ooh, yes. In a certain time of year, right? They really come out. Oranges, red cabbage, yeah. And you can make some nice fermented stuff with red cabbage. Red onions, radishes, cabbage, love it. In the oils. Okay, and then the oranges, think of more on the oranges. And, and you know, and we had a lot, these pictures were things that I got and they were just beautiful pictures of food. and. And they didn't have a whole lot of animal protein in them, but they have this one with salmon in here. So like thinking about like if you're eating red meat or other meat, like that's also a color and it has different different nutrients. If you're eating meat, it has different nutrients, different colored meats. But see how it just makes a really pretty rainbow of food that you can be ingesting and learning how to cook. You know, beans are a particularly um, nutritious piece of our diet that aren't really used that often because they're difficult to cook. We can get canned beans, that kind of thing. Uh, a brand called Eden is really good. Um, and then I, one thing I want to point out is like, we have to remember the herbs and spices. We have to remember the herbs and spices. Look at how colorful these herbs and spices are. That's their herbs and spices are plant foods. So the more we add herbs and spices to our food, they also have these phytonutrients, a lot of different different um, elements within the phytonutrients where that are going to help to digest our food. They're going to add micronutrients. So as, as creative as we can get with adding these beautiful herbs and spices, either in the dried form or the fresh form, um, they're going to be helpful in our diet, right? And, you know, because again, like they, there's all these sort of ideas of how to break up your plate. Yeah, parsley and basil, turmeric. Oh yeah, cumin, paprika, love that. Yeah, the things that you kind of go to, right? Um, but on our plate, sometimes these, these schematics say, okay, when you're looking at your plate, how are you gonna break it up? We're gonna have half vegetables and fruit, a little bit of whole grains and proteins and healthy oils and water on the side. Um, like, but then you look at your plate, you're like, okay, well, you know, again, like I, my heritage is meat, potato, vegetables. So I could divide my plate up into meat, potato, vegetables, but like, what's really helpful is when you make it into something that's really full of texture, you know, it might be a salad, it might be something more cooked, but like there's cheese, there's olives, there's beautiful oils on the dressing, and there's a variety of, of fresh vegetables and, um, you can make it really pretty. So it's not separated out in uh, segments, but you're sort of putting the, 
the combination. And this just takes time, obviously, to, to learn how to make it in a, uh, the right proportions and ratios. You can make a bowl with some cooked grains like quinoa or some cooked vegetables in there. You can make a whole thick bowl and there's more lettuce in this one, but that's okay. Um, or a soup. You can make a really delicious soup with all of these foods and these spices and really get creative. And these are nourishing your bones. They're nourishing your body and they're going to be nourishing your bones deeply, right? Um, and then it can even just be a sandwich, right? Whether it's a wheat um, toast or it can be a gluten-free toast, but like, look at how pretty this sandwich is. It doesn't have to be anything super fancy. Um, and in this, what's what sometimes you feel like your breakfast or your lunch or your dinner needs to be a certain thing. Um, but you can make it pretty simple. You can make it pretty simple and be creative. And I want to double down on my, my point of saying, you know, fats, we need to make sure we are not afraid of fats. We went through an era, um, back in the day when we were very much against fats. And, uh, I think that's kind of what led a lot of us to this, level of low bone density because we're eating low fat or non-fat, but fats are where those fat soluble vitamins, which are the bone building vitamins are. So not to be afraid of whole fats, you know, in different kinds, like there's a lot of different kinds on the screen. And like the guidelines said, there's a ratio. So you can have seed oils, but you just don't have as many. You have more of the other monounsaturated oils. Because the oils are kind of what happened with your when you're when you don't have fat in your diet, it's they've it doesn't taste good. It's not sa satiating. So then they added more sugar, which would spike your insulin, and then your blood sugar would, I mean, sorry, it would spike your blood sugar, the sugar would, and then it spike your insulin, and then your cortisol, and you go into this vicious circle. So a lot of these chronic inflammation states that we're in these days, I think, has it has sort of roots causes back in the low fat era which we're still sort of, it's a, it's a hard mindset to change, to, to allow yourself to have these, these fats in your diet. You want to, because you want to have sort of a 24 hour clock in your body. You want to have your fast while you're sleeping, but while you're in your daytime, you want to have the satiety and fats are going to be part of it. So if you're eating a, a, um, a, a sugary carb, not sugary, but like a carbohydrate, like an apple, you could have it with an almond, almond, almond butter, something like that, so that you're not like spiking your blood sugar. So this can be kind of overwhelming, or sometimes you can say, oh yeah, yeah, that's what I'm doing. I'm doing good. And maybe there's just like, you know, one step you can take that's different or one step that you can take towards your goal from the steps that we were thinking about for our bone health goal. Then maybe there is something that you have had came with a question and you um, it sparked an idea. Um, and there's like one little thing you could change from today's webinar. Um, you know, change can be a challenge. And I have had um, like five day challenges in the past. Maybe some of you have joined me for our nutrient boost challenge. It was five days and it's a lot of fun and we're all together and we have this um, new things that we're gonna try out for five days. Um, but then, you know, after the five days, maybe some things stick, but a lot of times you're left with like a few questions and you really don't know how to put it into practice. You kind of go back to your own ways, right? Your, your, your usual program. So I was thinking about how can we sustain this, this step towards finessing what we're eating, what we're eating on a daily basis so that we are really focusing on nourishing our whole body deeply so that we get to the bones, right? And I was thinking that there's one missing piece to a lot of these things is that, you know, you can take all the information off the internet. You can take the information that maybe you've gleaned from this presentation and you can go into your own world and, and maybe you start cooking a little bit differently or not, maybe you just do one thing differently, but what's really missing might be is a little bit community is how I, I kind of see it. And that's kind of what we get with those five day challenges, but what was the way that we could um, sort of sustain it for a longer period of time so that we can all support each other and help each other through these, um, so, you know, just keeping up, keeping the process up of eating really well for ourselves. Um, so I started, I'm starting a new Facebook group this is what I wanted to announce for you, is that it's called the Nutrient Boost Ch Challenge for Great Bones. And in this 
Facebook group. Some of you might be members of the Strong Bones Challenge um, Facebook group. And this is Susanna and I have been talking about making a sister Facebook group for this sort of thing, like just keeping people sort of having this, this fun way of connecting to making food and learning about food and, and keeping yourself sort of honest, like, okay, yeah, I had that birthday cake or whatever, you know, but, but Hey, I made this beautiful quinoa dish or like I made this, this tofu dish. It was amazing, you know? So I want to share it with you. So it's, and it's all kind of focused on nourishing your bodies deeply. So you nourish your bones. So in the, in this program or in this uh, Facebook group, we're going to be diving deeper into eating from the rainbow. What are those proteins, fats, carbohydrates, minerals, vitamins, phytonutrients for our bones? We're going to have challenges each month on maybe, you know, what do we do with this ingredient? How about we add sesame seeds to our foods this month? What can you do with sesame seeds? You know, different ideas of budget and food sensitivities, cooking for one skills. We're going to be talking about that in this Facebook group, preparation tips, and then cuisine variations. And that's why that we need a, a group of people that are interested in sharing their, their recipes, right? So because you're going to encourage each other and like with encouragement from a fun, non-judgmental, like-minded community for inspiration and accountability, right? Excuse me. There's... Um, you just go to the Facebook group page and you sign up, you've answered a few questions and you agree to the rules. And I wanna read the rules because this is pretty important because food can be kind of fraught. There's a lot of things that people think are the right way. So first of all, the number one thing is we're not gonna discuss supplements. This nutrient boost challenge is a challenge because we're gonna to try to get those nutrients boosted through food, right? Um, and food is more than or different than the sum of its parts. Remember, we're not going down the nutritionism, nutritionism route. And we nourish our bodies deeply, we nourish our bones. Number two, we support a wide variety of food philosophies. We're gonna be open and caring, whether you are vegan, vegetarian, omnivore, or whatever. There's no one diet that serves the needs of everyone firmly believe that. There are many, many reasons why people choose to eat the food they do. And we are here to encourage and inspire our fellow members to prepare food that boosts nutrients and not shame or convert. We're all doing the best we can with what resources we have. And we acknowledge that individual circumstances and needs vary. And then we're going to share and post food and meals and snacks and drinks. And we're here to encourage and inspire how to boost our osteoporosis friendly nutrients via the food that we eat and drink. We're going to share videos and, vid and fo photos of the meals you made, the ingredients, the recipes, your favorite kitchen tools, you know, what made this possible, links to other resources to help us learn and, en and enrich our nutrient repertoire. We're going to be kind and positive and like and love people's efforts. Um, we're all in this together in a welcoming and inspirational environment, much like what um, Susanna has created on the Strong Bones Challenge uh, Facebook group uh, is really helpful. It, you know, it's, um, if, it, if anybody's negative, they'll just be taken off the, the site. And we're not going to discuss meds or exercise or DEXA scans. Um, we're going to avoid that. There's other places you can discuss that. This is really all about our mission to augment our bone health plan with our healthy food. So our first monthly challenge starts on September 1st, which is Sunday, and we're going to begin with increasing the power of yum. So um, we're going to get out of our head and into our senses. So we're going to avoid that nutritionism trap. Remember, food is more than or different than the sum of its parts. Experiment with flavor and ingredients to boost your nutrients and develop a sense of curiosity and creativity. So we're going to keep it really simple, stress-free, dress -free, make it delicious, and, you know, I created this template, I've refined it over the years. Some of you might have an earlier version of this, the Power of Yum template um, for easy, nutritious and yummy one pot meals. So we're kind of really making simple things with bone building nutrients. I'll put these links in the chat so that you can actually um, get these, get to the Facebook group on this. You can download this template. The template has a, also helps people learn how to build these one pot meals. And if you're not a meat eater, like step three is adding meat to the pan, you either skip it or you add a, an alternative protein that might work in this, but it's just about how you build up the flavor in your, in your, in your one pot meals. And then there's a whole list of bone building nutrients foods um, in the back. So you can find out what kind of examples of protein or vitamin D or 
K2 or calcium, magnesium, mag manganese, phosphorus, zinc, and copper, and vitamin C, boron, and silicon. These are um, some of the key nutrients that scientists have discovered are really useful for our bones um, and what they do for building our bones and then some of the food sources. So you can start to like integrate more and more of these foods that you may or may not have um, any pri prior interest in using. <laughs> um, so we're quick and easy, yummy um, and holistic. You're gonna nourish your senses, nourish your body deeply, nourish your bones and get this power of yum. Right. So two steps from this webinar, you're going to first get the power of yum template because I know not everybody's going to want to join the Facebook group. Some people just are not on Facebook. So that's fine. But you can get the power of template and take it from there. Like the knowledge that I hope I'm hoping to inspire from this webinar and and see where it goes. And then you can join the nutrient boost challenge with this um, with this link. All right. So I am going to. All right. Stop the share, time for questions. I'm gonna first put in the, in the, this is a very different screen than I'm used to, sorry. I'm gonna put these in there. Some of you already signed up, okay. All right, so here is the link to the power of yum. Whoops, didn't mean to just send that to you. There's the link to the power of yum. And then here is the link to the Facebook page. And I did see some questions early on. And so I'm gonna scroll back. Um, Judy asks, what, should, what are your thoughts of pure stevia and protein powders if it does not increase a person's craving for sugar? Yeah, stevia is a, a you know a natural sugar, uh, a plant-based sugar. Um, if it does not increase a person's craving for sugar, I think that's fine. Sometimes it's about mouth feel, right? Um, if they say no, usually if they say no added sugar, they're putting some other kind of fake sugar in there anyway. So it's all about taste. Um, what about canola oil? Canola oil is an interesting one. You know, it's so many times I, I want to actually do a an interview with a chef someday, because so many times you'll see, um, you'll see uh, rest or uh, what do you want to call it? Like cooking shows or something. And then the recipe calls for canola oil. That's really common for, um, for a lot of recipes. Um, I think it's just because it's a neutral oil, but what I've kind of gone away is gone away from canola oil and gone more, to more towards something like avocado oil. It's a little bit more on the neutral side. That's what I would prefer, Cynthia. Okay, so let me see. Any other questions coming in? Okay. This says the new Facebook group sounds great. We'll be joining. Comment on nat natto, Cynthia asked about natto. I tend to use it for K2. That's amazing that you're using it because that is a very, that's a one that not would not check the boxes on a lot of people's to-do list, you know? <laughs> um, natto is fermented soybean and it you have to, sometimes you're lucky enough to actually um, uh, live near a place that has, a, you know, a, a store that would hold it. Otherwise, you have to order it online and it comes to you. But um, I think it's great. I think it's if you can eat it, um, it's it's another thing to just sort of add in, you know, you, you just rotate it in and you're getting that. So other, other sources of K2 are grass-fed um, meats and, and uh butters and things like that where where the grass because vitamin k we're taking in from our vegetables and then we have to convert it to k2 and our our conversion process is really kind of minimal on that level um so the ruminants the cows are eating the grass and they have the two stomach um conversion thing so when we're eating the byproduct of that the, the meat proteins then we're getting the k2 a little bit more on a bioavailable uh, level so that's, that's that. Um, okay, can you talk about the issue of oxalates that many calcium rich vegetables have, which reduce the absorption of calcium in those vegetables like beets and Swiss chard and spinach? Yes, this is another one that like, this is where the internet, whoa, 
internet explodes, you know, that book comes out about don't eat, you know, oxalates, it's terrible for your body. Some people are super, super sensitive to oxalates and they will get kidney stones and things like that. Um, most of the time, if you're cooking it, you're breaking it down enough that you're, you're, you're combining it with other things. And they are saying now, you know, the scientists are trying to get it right. They're trying to find out how do we do this? How do we do this? And they'll say, oh, well, now they're saying that the oxalates are only restricting the calcium of that item. So if you have chard, maybe you're not getting the calcium from the chard, but if you're eating it with a dairy product or something, and then that dairy, that dairy calcium is going to come in, it's not going to mimic that. That's what I've read recently. But um, uh, so if you're just eating vegetables and you're trying to get the calcium from that, like it's um, eating things like arugula or something that's less oxalate is going to be helpful too. But cooking is always going to break down them to an extent and you probably will be able to, um, to uh, uh, absorb it. Again, you're going back to how robust is your own, your own uh, gut health, that kind of thing. Does that help, Joan? You can you can unmute if you want to. Yeah, yeah. I mean, it's, yeah. It's like it's they don't really know is the answer. I guess I was just wondering what your what your thoughts are on it because yeah, right, exactly. Because I started eating dairy, which I didn't do for a long time for just that reason because I so so I don't know. And it's very hard to tell whether you're absorbing it or not when I mean, you have blood tests and urine tests and so forth. But you know, um, but yeah. I don't know. I just go by everything in moderation. Don't rely. I don't like spinach anyway, but like I wouldn't rely on all my all spinach and just, you know, I, and I limit on, I really, really like Swiss chard and I, I do don't eat as much of it as I used to because I thought, uh, you know, maybe I should just like pick something else. Right. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> well, and yeah. kale is always good. You know, I know yeah. people earlier said they didn't like kale, like, but yeah. Yeah, everything in moderation, I guess. You just have to right. Don't li eliminate anything, but don't become overly dependent on anything either. I guess you know. Exactly. What are you going to do? You have to eat, you know. So. Right. Exactly. Exactly. And then these new headlines just make us scared of another thing, right? So if we're making it a variety, and we're and I think you know adding the right spices, we're helping to the body to digest it, right? And that's the key. It'll break it down because they don't really know. They how, how could they really know? what it's right. happening for you in your body. Maureen's doing um, natto. She's exploring recipes. Yeah, maybe we'll have a challenge on natto. Hmm. <laughs> uh, yeah, no, flat out. Um, uh, about Jarlsberg cheese. Is it a superior cheese for our bones compared to others? Oh, that's a really good question. So yeah, I've seen lists of uh, of K2 in particular, and it names particular cheeses. I, I once joke like, oh, then you're actually going to be um, doing it. Sindhu, you have a comment on Jarlsberg? Yeah, go ahead. Thank you. Um, I'm trying to look for a raise hand. It, it's not showing <laughs> there. Yeah, but first of all, thank you so much for bringing in Ayurveda in your lecture today, and everything was so wonderful. Thank you. Um, two questions. First is, I know uh, we are not talking about the supplements here. Uh, still, it just came to my mind, you know, since we talked about uh, sardine, right? Uh, so fish oil capsules, um, are they any good? First thing. Second question is, um, before the norm was chewing 20, 32 times, right? 30, 32 times you chew the, the morsel, right? But now I have heard this is a new one for me, you know, come, uh, bringing it down to 20, <laughs> 20 times, not uh, from 32. So uh, I don't know, is it uh, because of time crunch? Of course that we know, but then again, we are just reducing the quality of the the, the food that we are intaking. So this right, is right. So two questions for you, and I want. I thought you had something to add to my comment about Ellie's Jarlsberg question. So I'm going to an answer Ellie's question about Jarlsberg, and then answer your two questions. So Jarlsberg cheese, um, brie cheese, uh, Gouda cheese are all listed as um, good for K2 input. Again, I think it has to do, and it probably also depends on where you're getting it from. If you're getting it from like those beautiful Irish fields of cows like you know milk from that like that'll have a lot more k2 but yeah there's certain ways i don't know enough about cheese production to understand why it has more of k2 but there are certain cheeses that um, are on the list that are better for your bones you know so that does answer your question ellie okay good and then for the fish oil supplements 
that is um there's there's a organization called consumerlabs.com and you can uh, you know be a member of it for nominal fee for the for the year i'm i'm a member of it i've learned a lot from it. it's kind of like consumer reports but it's for um, supplements and things and they do they study and they'll they'll test certain supplements and they've often will do the thing on fish supplements so when you have to worry about with fish supplements is sometimes it can be um uh rancid like some of the time if they're not well taken care of or it can be full of things like mercury depending on how they're sourcing it so um i can't remember the blue pastures i think it's green pastures blue pastures there's a there's a um there's a brand of fish supplement that I um, have used in the past and I really like it. So I would have say that that would be just find the, the highest quality if you're not a fish eater and you just want to get those, those oils in there. And your next question about chewing, I don't necessarily have, you know, it's funny because I think from a yoga perspective, if you were to chew everything 32 times, you would be focusing on what you're doing, right? You're to, focusing the mind on this one little thing that you're doing. So you're, you're counting to 32 times, but it depends on what you're putting in your mouth because before, you know, sometimes it's like the, the commercial with the, how many licks does it take to get to the center of the Tootsie Pop? Like one, two, and then they chew it. Like if you're chewing 32 times and then the food's disappeared, what more can you chew? So a number isn't, I don't think a requirement. I think the, the idea is to chew it until it's like, very well desiccated, or what, what's it called? Um, there's a word, I'm drawing a blank. Very well uh, masticated, that's the word. And and then it goes into your body, into your into your um, stomach, and it's more easily broken down. So that's really the goal. Because if you're chewing on, if you're a meat eater and you're chewing like a steak, it might take way more than 32 to, to fit that, right? Um, and if you're eating pasta, it might dis disappear in your mouth in two seconds. So that there's no, I don't think there's a dictated number. Thank you for clarifying that. Uh, yeah, it, it does make sense. You know, pasta, maybe three, four bites is okay. And then, yeah, chewing on meat uh, probably will take more than that. Yes, thank you. Thank you for that. Yeah, yeah. good, good. Okay, Robin asks, what do you think about soy products that supposedly influence dense breasts as I've been told to stay away from all soy products? Okay, so that's probably that's probably a good um, thing to think about um, because there are some phytoestrogens in soy products, so you want to sort of limit that. And if your doctors have recommended that, I would say probably a good good um, recommendation to follow through on. The they do say that some of the that when you have a fermented soy product, so if you're relying on soy as your main um, source of protein or something like that. And you're like, oh, I can't do tofu anymore. But you could do maybe the, you know, the more fermented products, you know, like tempeh or something like that. If you can do grains, that kind of thing. Um, Cause then it's already sort of pre-broke down. And so probably less of a, a influx of that. Does that make sense? Uh, Michelle says, lately I've been hearing about toxicity and arsenic and herbs that I'd like to use. Your thoughts and non-GMOs? Yeah, yeah, I've heard a lot about the arsenic and herbs too. And that's where the Consumer Labs is a good resource so that you can get the um, get their latest report. Um, there's, there's things that we just cannot eliminate from our life here on earth, right? <laughs> Um, so, I mean, if you're eating like a pile of parsley that's full of arsenic, you know, like let's get away from that, right? Like let's just have a little bit of, you know, bits of it. Maybe you get your, you have a, I don't know, if, I don't think you have the ability to have a garden where you are, but you could, well, you could, you could have probably have a little like herb garden, you know, and you have their soil tested and you're, you're building your own because the, these, these, um, uh, heavy metals come from the soil, right? So if you're growing, if you have that control, that's one thing the functional medicine group was saying was like, if you have control over some of your own food in, uh, production, then do that. Um, Non-GMOs, I'm on the fence about that. I'm, I, I want to have my food as unadulterated as possible, but I also have some friends who are are in that world of and they try to argue with me like there's nothing wrong with it so i don't know i don't want to go down that route it's kind of a, a fraught issue but if you can get something as simplified and clear and and 
um, un, unprocessed as possible, I think that's good. Uh, roll of nuts for protein. Yeah, nuts. But I would have have you soak them and dry them so that they've broken down the outer outer side of it so that they're more easily digested. So soaking nuts overnight, it depends on the nut, but usually like an almond, you would soak them overnight, um, rinse them off in the morning and then put them in a low oven and then until um, they're crispy. Or you could use them soaked and put them in your... Um, oatmeal or whatever you're eating in the morning right then or make your nuts but that's going to help because like think about your nuts and seeds are little little plants to begin with and they're protecting all of the nutrients of building into a plant themselves so um, we want to break down that outer shell does that make sense would grinding them substitute for that mm, not really not really mm. but mm, i mean oh i yeah, I eat a lot of nuts and I was doing that. And I was actually, because I don't have a dehydrator, I was using the oven. I was concerned that the oven was hotter than a dehydrator. And so I didn't know if, even if I put it on warm and I leave it on 24 hours. Oh. The other part was that um, walnuts are fine like that, but pecans and almonds, they lose flavor. And then I don't want to eat them. <laughs> yeah. I still yeah. have some in my refrigerator, like a probably three, five months old that I got, you know. That... Well, it's good that you're keeping them in your refrigerator because they will get like stale or oxidated. Yeah, no, I don't. Yeah. So, I can... no. Yeah. Yeah. I wouldn't really, you know, you can, I, what I do is I grind them after I've soaked them and stuff so that they have a different texture or something like that. So I still do the soaking and, and drying and maybe we'll do a little, we'll do a little, um, workshop on that so can oh, you peanuts i eat a lot of peanuts is that all right they're le legumes they're legumes they're not nuts there yeah so that's good it's a good sense of protein they can um you get a good good quality pro uh, peanut because sometimes they can have a lot of mold attached to them but um but that's something to think about do you have a particular brand that you like i just get it at the health food store you know? yeah that's probably good yeah okay. that's probably good Thanks. Cynthia says, it took me a few weeks, but I've learned to really like natto. Ooh, you're going to be our expert in natto then. But <laughs> I like beans too. Okay. And Joan says, it's also an issue of the amount of calcium in the cheese. Harder cheeses are better in that regard. Yes, that's right. So you can, you know what I've gotten to do? My husband doesn't eat cheese, so we don't put a lot of cheese into things, but I got some Parmesan cheese and then I keep it in the freezer because it'll just get moldy from the little that I eat, how fast we do it. But, um, I keep it in the freezer and then I'll sprinkle it on my omelet or, you know, I'll just add it or boost it. So that's what you'll learn in the power of yum handout is how to boost these nutrients. Like just adding some sesame seeds or adding a sprinkle of Parmesan cheese, like just adding these things in, in above the, it boosts the flavor. It boosts the nutrients, right? Um, Kathy says, love the new Facebook group idea. I'm in. Do you have a cookbook you love? Oh, so many cookbooks, right? And it's, you know, I still go to the internet too to look for a quick, if I have something I need to cook. And I'm like, how, how long do I have to cook that? Um, what do I, I don't really have a favorite one because I just love them all. <laughs> um, but I find that, you know, that could be something we could do on Facebook is sharing the books that we like, you know, like, because I think there's a lot out there. I've learned a lot from Samin Nazra and her Salt, Fat, Acid, Heat. That's a really great book where you're actually learning to cook and she's, um, you know, learning how to uh, use these, um, the salt, the fat, the acid, the heat. She also did a Netflix show on that, on a book, but she's a, a great resource. Um, and Otolenghi is a good cookbook author. He's a chef in England. Um, he's got a, some books called Plenty and uh, something else. There's several, several that he has. But beautiful cookbooks too. And I used to be in publishing. So I really like the books as objects. So like I can just pour over a book. That's really nice. Um, soaking nuts also reduces oxalates. Yes, that's what I'm getting on the outside of the of the um, nuts. Yeah, important for almonds. Yep. Thank you for this wonderful Amnar. Get back to work. All right. Can you repeat the books? Um, so the Otolenghi is a is a cookbook author. The The book is called Plenty. That's the one book that I can remember. And he has a bunch of other cookbooks. And then Salt, Fat, Acid, Heat is the other one by Samin Nazarat. Those two. All right. Any other questions? We're past our time. So thanks for hanging in there, those of you who stayed. 
you can unmute un if it's taken too long to write. <laughs> but you motivated me, so you inspired right. me. I really, I'm a person that keeps avoiding cooking, so. And I was looking at everything and you, it was so engaging. The webinar was totally engaging and it got me like, oh my God, I'm really actually interested in this again. So, <laughs> <laughs> yeah. So you and I'll be in touch. Yeah, no, I really like to join your group and make myself do it because. Yeah, well, we'll, you know, we'll all be there to root each other on, right? That's yeah. it. That's, you know, it'll be fun. I think it'll be fun. Like, there's like a lot of like fraughtness about, oh, what do I do with my bones? Like, and, and, you know, I sometimes lose my mojo about cooking too. And so I just really would like to have this like group interaction. We keep each other accountable. A couple more questions came in. Let's see. Do you add salt to food? I do. I do add salt. And, um, but if you've been told by your doctor, because of, again, osteoporosis is not the only thing we have, right? Some people might have high blood pressure or heart disease and salt might be an issue. But here's the thing with salt. When they say lower the salt, they're talking about so sodium in particular. And what really happens is that people are eating a lot of processed foods. There's a lot of added sodium to those things. If you are eating more fresh foods and you're adding salt for flavor, you're adding way less salt than you would in the, in the manufactured food. And if you're adding a salt like a like a Celtic sea salt or Himalayan sea salt, something more of a minerals rich salt, then you're getting more than just the sodium. And a lot of times the sodium is just the fact that we don't have enough potassium in our body. We need to have actually more potassium. But yeah, I add salt to food, but if you know if, if salt is an issue for you, those are kind of the tips. Like, are you getting your salt? Are you in charge of your salt intake? You know, you can add a little salt for flavor because again, we want to we want to enjoy our food. This is the first part of our our digestive system, right? Okay, lots of thank yous and looking forward to the new group. I'm happy about that. Yes, you have live blood pressure. Yeah, the blood sodium is too low. Oh, that's interesting. Yeah, yeah. So I think that's something to think about getting a better salt that you have. Great. Thank you, Kathy. Excellent presentation, content, and graphics. Love this. Wonderful. Great. All right. Well, I will see you all in, you know, or, you know, see those who want to join the Facebook group in the Facebook group. Um, and yeah, there's lots to think about. And I think it's going to be a lot of fun. And um, I'm kind of out of pocket for the next couple of days. I will be peeking in um, when we're not driving in the evening I'll poke in but the the challenge begins on Sunday and we'll and we'll go from there so uh, we'll kind of work it out as we go um, and then get the power of yum if you don't want to join the Facebook and and then uh, we'll go from there all right okay thanks everybody take good care thank you happy travels thank Bye. you thank you